is straight to the source. Your destination for food, views and big ideas. Brought to you by two of the best in the business, Tonya Barr and Lucy Allon. Join them to discover some of Australia's most dynamic food, hospitality and agribusiness leaders. Hello and welcome to Food, Views and Big Ideas. I'm Tonya Barr. And I'm Lucy Allen. And this is the podcast from us here at Straight to the Source. In this podcast, we will be introducing you to the people who are driving our food and hospitality industry forward. Whether it be on the land, in the water, in the kitchen or from the boardroom. Each of our guests are playing a significant role in the evolution of Australia's food identity and culture. And we want you to know who they are, their views and their big ideas. Welcome back to Straight to the Source. I'm Tanya Barr, and today our guest in the studio is Isaac Martin. Isaac is a pastry chef turned social media influencer, and that's why we've actually brought him into the studio today. That mix of skills gives him quite a unique perspective on the world of food and hospitality. Apart from having 215,000 followers on Instagram at Isaac underscore eats a lot, Isaac also runs a marketing company called Chew Crew Media. As an influencer in the big burger and fast food space, Isaac has an ambition greater than a smash burger with extra sauce, and he's here today to talk about it. Isaac, welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. You have um, quite a following of diehard burger and fast food enthusiasts on your personal channels. I do. But you also have a business called Chew Crew Media. I do. And you're a father of four young children. I have four beautiful children, yeah. And a very beautiful wife. And an amazing background. So I think we just dive right in. And um, how did it all start? Tell us your pathway. Um, Well, I mean, to be honest, like I I was enrolled at, I, straight out of high school, I joined the Navy, never even made the Navy. Like I had an enlistment date and met a girl before that enlistment date and pulled the pin very early on. Um, but then sort of I pivoted and went to like plan B, which was um, university. And so I always wanted um, – I grew up in a small country town and so I was always interested in sports and and sort of being a Queensland male and stuff. So I was like, all right, PE teaching, great. Like um, my parents were both primary school teachers, so I'd grown up sort of in the education system and I always liked sport and it was like, all right, good, good marriage, right? Like um, – Last, which, oh, sorry, which country town? Uh, Laidley. So in the Lockyer Valley of Queensland, the salad okay. bowl region. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of great produce and stuff, but kind of halfway between Toowoomba and Brisbane. Mm-hmm. Uh, lasted six months at university. And it was more just, I think, because it was a rushed thing. Like I, I got into the uni I wanted. I got the course I wanted. Um, but it was kind of being that plan B option. It was kind of a rushed option and the commute was a bit yucky and um, the girl that I had pulled out of the Navy to be with, like that relationship didn't work. And so I was kind of like in this plan B that I had opted for, but the circumstances had changed again. Long story short, took six months off. So I I took kind of like my, I I called it like my gap year, even though it was six months and um, just worked like a, you know, a local casual job full time. Um, or 30 hours a week and, and sort of did my, I grew up with a single mum, And so I did a lot more around the house that, you know, as a 18 year old guy, I was capable of doing like a lot of heavy yard work, got into cooking, um, and really fell in love with baking. Um, and so I think that summer, uh, that winter or, or maybe the next March, one or the other, uh, we kind of went on a little family holiday and we went to Europe and so it was just like one of the the multi bus tour type things, but um, seeing sort of like I had fallen in love with baking, and I think it was the control element. Like it's all very precise, it's very controlled, um, due process, and then you get this beautiful result at the end. So it was something that I could control and manipulate and and feel an accomplishment at the end of. And then we went to Europe, and I just fell in love with kind of like the history and the tradition, and and in Australia, I think you know we see a lot of hospitality is just a means to an end. Like we need nutrients and nourishment and it's food, it's breakfast, lunch, dinner. And when you see a culture where it's so much more than that, it's, it's, you know, a theatrical thing, watching pastry chefs that have been doing it for 40 years, 
and they don't look like they hate their life still doing it or entire shops that just focus on one specialty, like just gelato, just chocolate, just maybe pastries or uh, like and not just just pastries, but they might only do one or two pastries, but their signature like known for it. So we came home from that and I fell in love with it um, and kind of straight away started looking into and I was because of kind of option A had been a flop and option B had been a flop. I was kind of hesitant to invest in it. So I wasn't sure if, you know, I wanted to pay like a private training provider like a, a William Anglis or a Le Cordon Bleu, fifteen twenty thousand dollars for a, a hospitality sort of certificate. Sorry, can I jump in? How yeah. old were you at this time? So this would have been like the year that I was turning nineteen. Mm-hmm. Um, and I found this this training course in Melbourne, um, and it was government subsidised, so it was quite cheap to do the course because I was an Australian citizen. And I was kind of like, we, we'd been to Melbourne once um, while I was younger, sort of on a family holiday. And I was like, straight away, in my opinion, I think Melbourne is more European than Brisbane or Sydney um, in terms of culture and, and the hospitality scene. So I was like, look, if I'm going to do it, um, then I think that's the best city for me to sort of immerse myself in, in Australia. So when you say going to do it, you mean become a pastry chef? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like study, sort of mm-hmm. commit to it. And I also felt that kind of like I was still living at home and I felt like not the easy option, but, you know, the previous two options I was living at home and so it was easy to opt out of. You know, I had a safety blanket. Mm -hmm. And so I went, uh, you know, I enrolled in the course. I remember my mum and I packed all my bags and then she flew me down. I think it was Australia Day. It was stinking hot. It was a public holiday. So like half of Melbourne was shut and we're trying to check into this student accommodation in Melbourne. Um and so for the next 12 months, I was in Melbourne. I did a, a cert three in pastry um, or patisserie and then realized kind of not that I was homesick, but I think I wasn't ready to sort of throw myself into – like I'd done some work experience in restaurants and stuff and I'm not cut out for like restaurant service. It's just – it's not my thing. I, I don't – I think like that pressure of mm. the line and, and everything – so I was kind of at a, a crossroads and I was like, oh, what do I do? So I came home, enrolled in um, the Toowoomba TAFE, the Southern Queensland Institute of TAFE, and just got a, a diploma of hospitality. I went, well, if I'm kind of biding my time, not sure what to do, I'll keep training, keep educating myself. Paperwork, like qualifications last forever. So came home, got um, myself that, and, and that was the year of those massive Queensland floods mm-hmm. where it was like just – no one could predict it happening. It was inland. There were tsunamis and all sorts of weird stuff. And so a large chunk of that 12 months whilst I was training was also kind of like community work and, and sort of, um, you know, I wasn't ever a volunteer for the SES or this or that, but in a small country town, everyone gets involved, right? It's very hands-on. So I think that kind of showed a lot of, um, what's the word? Like it put a lot in perspective mm-hmm. how – doesn't matter who you were or what you were doing, like nature sometimes can give you a kick up the backside. And so I did a little more research and like I still, I loved my year in Melbourne. I still was convinced that Melbourne was the place to be if I wanted to pursue it as a career sort of patisserie. And I can't remember now exactly how I found it. I don't know if I was Googling. I don't know if it was through like MasterChef because that was, you know, sort of at the peak of MasterChef, like 2015. Um, And so... I found this private training school in Melbourne called Saver um, Chocolate School. Kirsten Tibbles and, and a few other really great chefs were, were doing these private training classes in two or three-day chunks. And we had a, a family friend, like a, a very old family friend that was living in Melbourne and he was married and had kids. And, and I kind of reached out to him and I was like, look, if I come down for a two-week chunk and do a couple of these courses back to back to back, are you cool if I crash on your couch? And he... You know, he's a very good and, – and I really appreciate him as a friend. He, he was didn't even ask questions. was like, yep. So I was on his couch for two weeks, uh, did the training course uh, or courses, kind of mainly focusing on, on chocolate work, but also a couple like of entremet and gateau type ones. Those are intensive workshops. Yeah, right? yeah. Like yeah. – and, and, you know, a high skill level. I they, they tier them. So like, you know, they do chocolate – level one, level two, level three. So as an entry person, like anyone could go and do level one. Mm -hmm. But as you progress, obviously, and the idea is that once you've done one, that you'll do level two and level three. So you see the progression of skills. 
but it was, and it's, you know, the old adage of hospitality and networking, like, I just I was genuinely interested. So in our lunch breaks, I was asking questions of of the training chefs and sort of I was noodling around things. And and a lot of the other students were from out of the area. Like they'd flown in just for this course. They'll go back to their regular job or or you know their current provider paid for them to do the training. And I was kind of noodling around and noodling around. And Graham Kennedy, I think one of the the chocolate chefs there, great guy, great sense of humor. I don't know if he sort of recommended a job to me. Or if by chance I saw it online, because, you know, I was scouring Gumtree and all the sort of, you know, seek and stuff for, for pastry chef jobs. And I managed to get an interview at a place called Cacao Fine Chocolates in Moorabbin. So we know we know Tim Clark yeah. and the whole team very, very well. Yeah, he's also a great guy, very funny. Well, yes, and, and that particular um, cacao have quite a reputation for creating delicate, handcrafted, artisanal, yeah, yeah. you know, high-quality chocolates, macarons, pastries. Yeah, um, and, and just by absolute – like it was one of those domino things where things could have fallen a different way and I didn't get a job. And at the end of my two weeks of training, I might have come home to Queensland and who knows what would have happened. But – this sort of noodling around with Graham led me to this interview with, with Tim and, and the pastry chef at the time who was sort of general manager for him. I, I can't remember his name, sorry. But Austrian guy, like really, really good but strict, you know, European trained. Um, and they, you know, the, their production facility, they had a macaron section, they had pastry section, they had chocolate section. And I was really only interested in chocolate. Mm. And they just, they needed someone in chocolate at that time. So I sort of got a walk-in job like... And I was still living in Queensland at the time. I had a bag packed full of stuff for eight or nine days, no chef gear really with me. And I was kind of – in the interview with Tim, I was like, I can't really start work straight away. Like I need to go home and sort some stuff out. And he was fine with it. He was kind of like, but, you know, you need to give me a start date that you can start by. And so I, I must have asked for two weeks or three weeks and I kind of flew home, packed a bigger bag, spoke with the family friend and said, look, can I stay here a bit longer until I can find a place? And, you know, it's one thing led to another, um, ended up getting a, a rental unit quite close by and worked there for three and a half, four years. Okay. Um, yep. and, and, like, I really loved my time there. In, in another sliding doors world, I would have progressed and, and kind of even, – even at the four – like, chocolate is, as a specialty is such an in-depth thing. Like, I scratched the surface in terms of my knowledge of it. But um, even after the four years, you know, you start getting that, oh, maybe I can do something on my own. Maybe I should open something. Maybe I should. Um, and that's kind of like when I met my now wife uh, who was, you know, living in Sydney at the time. And I would have been 24, 25. Is she from Hospo? No, no. Okay. So she's never been Hospo. Um, okay. Ironically, like not into food blogging. Not into hospo other than kind of like she she's a great sort of like Western Sydney girl, like pub grub, like schnitty and chips, steak and chips. Yep. Um she's got a Filipino background, so she loves spaghetti. She loves sort of humble food, like but good, you know, mm-hmm. Aussie food. And then did the dating thing for a while and and kind of like she had children to a previous partner, so it was a lot harder for her to come to Melbourne to see me. So I was, you know, flying out of Melbourne after my last shift on a Friday and spending two nights and making sure I was back Sunday night to start Monday morning again. And after three months, I was kind of like, I can't do it. Mm. It's just killing me working a full week and then doing the commute. And yep. and so I was at that, that decision point where I was like, look, I love chocolate. I could stay here and do the next progress in, in chocolate or I can go on a new adventure and kind of like see where it goes with this, this woman. Um, when you look at hamburgers, fast food, schnitty and all that, that's at the opposite spectrum, isn't it? Oh, yeah. From, <laughs> it's the refined traditional techniques of being a chocolatier. I haven't even touched on it because I'm caught up in sort of, mm-hmm. I guess, my, my hospo background. But like throughout that whole period while I was in Melbourne and, and prior to that, I'm a, uh, I love American things and so I obviously like fast food. But f- probably from that same period like where I had the gap year and I fell in love with baking – I also have always had a an interest in competitive eating mm. as like a, a food challenge, big eats type guy. And in the states, that is um, massive. Yeah. Like yeah. it's it's a bona fide yeah. job that you can kind of monetize and and be in a, a league where you're getting sponsorship dollars and and appearance money and and all sorts of revenue. Yeah. In Australia, like you're lucky if you get a free meal. 
Um, and so when I was living in Melbourne for those four years on a first year pastry chef chocolatier wage, which <laughs> oh, is not great, um, you know, the idea of a free meal was amazing. Mm. So I kind of kept an, a keen eye out for a lot of opportunities that I thought I could get a free meal. Mm-hmm. And that's sort of where the food blogging side of Isaac took off because I'd been posting immaculate, beautiful chocolates that I made and and I was trying to do the stylized photography. I had like crushed peanuts sprinkled everywhere and it was on like white or black acrylic. So it was like shiny and reflective. No one gave a rat's ass. Yeah. No, one. maybe a few niche other chefs that kind of could appreciate it. The general public, I don't think, care. But this was your personal Instagram. Yeah, it was, it was right? a personal Instagram. It was your Instagram. little playground that you, yeah, were, yeah. you, you had no um, ambition other than just to no, no, yeah. share your yeah, yeah. life. Trying, well, I mean, and I'd, I'd learned like that, a very important lesson through that time at Saver, what networking meant already, mm. like mm. straight away. So if I could connect with other pastry chefs and other chocolatiers through that medium, and this, this was, to be honest, like really at the fore of what Instagram was like it was around for years before that but it was always that personal platform Mm. where you shared pictures of your puppies and your garden and your family and and then it was really around the time that I was fortunate enough to be on that that uh, meteoric bell curve rise of Instagram around 2015 2016 where I started posting more competitive eating images Mm -hmm. big burgers big pizzas that my profile just took off so is that when you had kind of a big idea going, hmm, maybe I can make a living doing this? Nah, not e- no, not even to be honest. Like I was fortunate enough in Melbourne, like while I was a pastry chef, I had a friend who was a plumber and a friend who was a, a warehouse worker, but all three of us liked comp eating. Mm. And so that made it kind of even more of a spectacle because instead of one guy sitting there eating a big burger by himself, there would be three of us sitting there eating big oversized food. But in terms of the the content, you know, three massive burgers side by side is kind of like – a spectacle that in 2015 was just in Australia kind of new. And having exciting. that theater and having it accessible to everyone. Yeah. Was 100%. something new. And, and I, I don't even know really why. I mean, I was posting the chocolate stuff and it would get half a dozen likes from personal friends and family, maybe a few chefs. And then just out of nowhere, like some of these big burgers or big pizza posts started going obviously universal, like around the world significantly more likes, you know, our follower count started increasing because they were showing an interest in it. And then it's like any new behavior you do, like when you get a positive response from it, you kind of repeat Mm, it. mm. So Feeding the beast. Yeah, we're we're getting these new followers and extra likes and, you know, it's by no means were we famous, but all of a sudden within this very small sort of burger community, we might go somewhere and someone would recognize you. Mm -hmm. And so then you – I mean, all three of us then almost assumed personas because, you know, once you start becoming a spectacle and people gawk at you or watch you or show an interest in you, you need to give them something to watch. Mm -hmm. So we all, you know, gave ourselves names and monikers in the eating world to kind of – I think at that that point we realized we had something potentially – and what was yours? Was so it? I, I was Sir Eats a lot. Okay. Yep. And the, the Sir part always came from competitive eating. For anyone who's watched it, can be quite messy, mm-hmm. um, quite grotesque, kind of to the average viewer. And I was always the neatest eater, probably, of our group. <laughs> um, and I always liked to do, like. I, I'm still now in in six or seven years of burger blogging. I hate dropping something on my shirt or sort of like on my shorts. I just I curse at myself for the rest of the day looking at it. I'm like, oh my god, that's got a stain. Um, so that was where the sir came from. And the other two were kind of chompomatic and he was, he was probably the people's favorite. Mm-hmm. Like he, he would wear a utility belt with ketchup in it and, and all sorts of things. And then the other guy was Hulk smash food. Okay. Yeah. And that's uh, originally, um, Chew Crew Media in its earliest form was the Chew Crew and the Chew Crew was the three of us. Ah, uh, okay. But they're not yeah. business partners today. No, no. Like, that. yeah. yeah. That's solely yours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's sort of where the evolution of the naming came from. Well, what's interesting is there's 4.6 billion people that actively use social media worldwide. But in Australia, 21 million, over 21 million yeah. people are on social media. So in terms of having a platform, it's just uh, it's infinity, isn't it? Yeah. And, it's, and I mean, I, I don't know the exact number, but I think our entire population is 26 million mm. for Australia. So when you consider that almost 
80% of the population is on social media when, and again, I don't know the statistics, but I bet 80% probably don't have access to healthcare and 80% yeah. probably don't um, have full-time jobs or, or, you know, an income that puts them in the median. Mm-hmm. It, it's a an interesting stat, certainly, to know so many people have access to social media and, and use it. Well, today you have, on my last count, 215,000 followers. Now, my question to you is, did you buy them or are they authentic? Nah, nah. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to straight up ask no, no, yeah, because no, this is an important I, um, – I'm quite well known for being very stern on this fact. Like I've worked long and hard um, to get – to where I am and, and the following I've got, you know, it wasn't an overnight success. I know I said it started meteorically in the beginning, but even then it's a slog. Like you get a result, you've got to keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. Um, there was one incident probably five years ago, and, and I've spoken with Meta head office about this. Like they've literally said they can't police or control it a great deal. Um, the in terms accounts. of, the, yeah, the, the fake accounts, the bots, the the buying of followers. Um and ironically, like, they wouldn't put it in writing. It was a, a Zoom chat. But, like, they almost said to me they really don't care. So why do you suppose that is? Because it's still generating content. It's still generating action? or um, I think at the end of the day, it doesn't affect their revenue at all. Right. Okay. So like the it, more the merrier just in there. They – all right, it might get them negative PR from time to time. But depending on who you speak to, any PR is good PR or publicity because – in reality, it's create like keeping their app and their platform at the fore of conversation. Um, I think that if anything ever irritates them, it'll be obviously they're losing. Like someone is spending money on buying fake followers somewhere and Instagram aren't getting a clip of that. So that might irritate them, if nothing else, because I know they're very big on revenue. So how do you get verified if you have an Instagram account? Um, it's like anyone can apply for verification now. It, it's really just... You've got to prove certain things. Like the biggest one is you've got to prove true identity of who the account is so that you can't kind of hack someone's account and then quickly try and get verification and, and say that it was you all along. That seems to be happening more and more. 100%. And like any rules or regulations, I'm sure there are loopholes and, and sort of ways around it. And there must be people in certain positions that you know might do favors or take – a little cash on the side to push something through. And at the end of the day, the entire, like anything on the internet, and it's where the argument for the whole decentralized blockchain stuff comes from, anything on the internet can be manipulated because it's an algorithm that you and I can't access or or manipulate, but very, very intelligent people somewhere can. And so if it's manipulatable, then it's hard to always say what is true and accurate. Like, there's always a, a chance or element or risk that someone's altered it or it's not authentic um, or they've gone a roundabout way of doing it. The, the traditional authentic way is just you've got to be sort of like a, a person of public interest mm-hmm. or a brand of public interest. You've got to verify that you're relevant. Mm-hmm. Um, so unfortunately, like if you were very relevant five or six years ago, but you've gone underground or something happened in life and and now you're trying to make a comeback. If you're not relevant, relevant, like current time relevant, then it's very hard to get that um, tick of approval. Or you've got to kind of be able to prove that for some reason your account or your identity is at jeopardy of being replicated, reproduced, um, you know, and you need to be able to prove, well, like this is the real me and all of these other people are copycats or catfishing, or a scheme, a scam of some sort. Um, And then if you can prove that somehow, then often they'll kind of be like, well, all right, like for your safety or for your business's safety, this tick is kind of like us saying you're the real one Mm -hmm. and the rest are fakes. Right. Which is hard now when the fakes can buy the tick. I was just going to say, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've experienced that with Twitter recently as well, haven't we? Oh, yeah, well. Yeah, depending on who's at the head of any business, it can <laughs> go a bit helter-skelter. So, I mean, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, what, what is your take on from a hospitality perspective? Where, where is hospitality sitting? Is it predominantly Instagram? Look, it, it used to be, for sure. Like, Facebook was always – and, and it, it's funny how it's kind of – it's worked in generations. Like, Facebook was really popular, I would say, like, 2000 to 2010. And so – 
the generation that were most active on it and learned to use it and are most comfortable with it are probably now like 40 to 50-year-olds because they were in their 20 to 30s in that period when it took off. Mm -hmm. And so it was how they communicated with family and it was how they networked in their industry and it was all these important things. And then I would argue that like Instagram was 2010 to 2020. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you're probably looking at like people who are now 20 to 35 Mm -hmm. being dominant on it or most successful on it. And then now you're looking at the TikTok era, which is 2020 to presumably when it ends. Um, And I would almost argue that like the way that technology works, each dominant era will probably get shorter and shorter because the next new thing comes faster. Mm -hmm. But it also, I think, lends itself to anything like both Facebook and and TikTok, uh, Facebook and Instagram, sorry. So the meta parent company were a free platform free to use, just get as many users on the platform as possible, and then that's it. That's its peak. So it's got its highest user base. It's free. Everyone loves it. It's working great. And then as the company, you go, all right, how are we? How sustainable is this? How do we get our money back for everything we've invested? And the minute you kind of start monetizing something fun and changing the experience for the user, you'll start kind of – you. You drop off the other side. So Instagram right now is just – it's losing market share to TikTok, not because there's anything wrong with the platform, but because it's not as fun. And so if it's not as fun, then users won't engage with it. And if users aren't engaging with it, then it's not as beneficial for businesses to advertise on. So as a as a uh, – uh, I hate the word, but as an influencer or as someone that like brands want to affiliate with and companies want to pay for for um, advertisements and stuff, I've noticed significantly in the last eighteen months that you know even though my Instagram is bigger than my TikTok, majority of brands come to me straight away and go like, "What's your fee for a TikTok?" Mm-hmm. They just know that UGC, like the user generated video content on TikTok, is significantly a, a more sound investment than anything on Instagram or Facebook. Mm, interesting, isn't so it? For a business, like I think in the last six months in particular, like more and more hospo businesses, they might have no idea what they're doing, but they just see TikTok and go, we've got to be on it. Like we're just mm. getting on it mm. and just content. Like, and, and it's what you listen to all of the, the entrepreneurial people. They kind of just say, you don't have to know what you're doing. Like just dump content, just put out the content. Someone will like it or you'll learn and sort of evolve it as, as you – interact with the platform itself, you'll learn new tools or you'll you'll kind of go, oh, that didn't work this time, what worked better next time? And so I think this period is the fun period on TikTok and, and the, the best time for anyone to get on a business or personal. I know when, you know, bloggers, food bloggers first started, it was about 15 years ago or yeah, something, yeah. and it just started to come into Australia. It's like and traditional then, web blogging, like yes. I had a website, yeah. Yes, and you're telling your story and you can, you know, have creative license and you can write however you would like and, you know, you would just put it out there without any um, checks and balances and no editor it was, to report to. It was opinion, to. yeah. Yeah, it was total opinion reviews. So food journalists, professional restaurant reviewers, traditional marketing companies kind of got their backs up a bit. Yeah. And they're like, hang on, who are these guys, you know? And they didn't necessarily embrace it straight away because I think from from that perspective, especially back then, how do you monetize it, right? So you go, okay, these bloggers are asking for free food. Yeah. You know, instead of instead of because they're not considered professionals um, and invoicing for their services. So what's your what's your opinion on that? Because I've got a lot of colleagues that have certain viewpoints and, yeah. and they've changed over the years as well as professionals like yourself have created legit businesses. Yeah. Thank have, you. have come to the to the top. Yeah. It's funny. I am. Um, so I've I've never been, you know, backwards and coming forwards. So I from day one, like I was not. um afraid to message a venue and say, hey, this is what I do. If you're interested in it, like, would you – and, you know, I still tell anyone who messages me today who's starting out, I'm like, you got to be humble. If if you don't have a huge platform, be mindful of what you expect and what you're asking for. When I started, I was paying $50, $60 for big burgers because that was the content I wanted, I needed. And if I'm not willing to pay for it, don't expect to get it. And And so as it grew, it was like, you know, maybe I was happy to get – one free item at a cafe or a burger place, like a free burger. 
And then as your your following and your skill set and your content develops, gets better, you go, oh, look, maybe maybe it's not worth my time unless it's $50 worth of food or $100 worth of food. But you're right in the sense that as like with anything, it was sort of a new thing. Um, there are no, and even now, like to be honest, in terms of social media and influences and advertising, and um, the, and I don't know, I don't know if it's the A Triple C or one of the bodies that sort of regulate advertising. Um, it's not the A Triple C; it must be an advertising agency. But um, like they're just now in 2022 starting to really crack down on making sure that it is public information, like what is paid, what isn't paid, um, making sure people declare what they're getting and what they're not getting. But I've always been of the opinion that essentially it's a negotiation. If you're a restaurant owner and I say, hey, mate, um, your food looks really good. I've got this platform. My idea is I want to generate this video for you would you be willing to give me a free meal if I come in and do that? Mm-hmm. Now, you can just say no as the business owner. Negotiation over, like done. And I've done it respectfully. You've done it respectfully. N- no one gets hurt. Yeah, Where's yeah. the fine line between Chew Crew Media and Isaac Loves to Eat? Uh, so, or eats a lot. Sorry, let me just Well, I mean, neither, neither is wrong. I do <laughs> love to eat and I do eat a lot. Yes, Okay. So I, I like to split it down the middle in the sense that like True Crew Media is when I work with a, a business ongoing. Like that is a, a management media consultation endeavor. Mm-hmm. So that is me coming into your business and working on your business. So I have a venue, yep. right? And I contact you. Yep. You come in and I share with you our menu, our ethos, our values. You suss out our location. Do you help me with the strategy? Or what execution? Officially, no. Unofficially, okay. yes. Like I've had people telling me for years like, oh, why don't you go into consulting? Why don't you charge for consulting? And I'm really uncomfortable with um, – I've never owned a hospitality business. I've been a, a cook. I've been a chef. I've been around hospitality businesses for 10 years. And I've probably been in more hospitality kitchens behind the scenes than most people. Um, but it's not a degree. It's not – you know what makes my knowledge more valuable than your knowledge already? So I tell anyone that I work with, like that, I really struggle to charge for consulting. But if you work with me, like my brain is there, pick it. Mm. I will give you opinions. I will give you uh, ideas. I will give you. And and we were talking about it uh, before the podcast started about how sometimes people kind of live in a bubble, sort of they live and work in the same city. Often when you're in a, a business. And it's if you're the owner of the business or you're a full-time chef in the business, you know, you might only see your home, maybe the gym or the supermarket and that business. Like it's very hard for you to get outside of that circle because it's just you're in that cycle, that rinse cycle of go home, sleep, family, go to work, go home, work. work. So having and, that fresh perspective. Yeah, I'm, I'm outside yeah. eyes that can kind of see trends that are happening in other areas or see, you know, uh, reaffirm you like don't worry if your cafe is quiet this week like every area of sydney is quiet this week it's not mm. you it's them or type mm. thing um and so the isaac eats a lot side is more me the influencer like me the personality me the public profile where you know true crew media won't necessarily review a venue and give an opinion on it because that's not what it's there for. It's not there to judge. It's there to help. Isaac eats a lot, may very well do a review of a venue and say, I didn't like it. Or, um, do you do, do many negative reviews? Is it kind of, if it's not, you know, look, positive, uh, don't talk about do, it? Do you know what really? And it's, I think it's where traditional food journalists I envy. Like, yeah, okay, they go and they pay for their meal. So they are entitled to be 100% brutally honest. If you take a free meal from someone or you get uh, an opportunity, whether it's like to film behind the scenes in the kitchen because you've requested it, or maybe they've opened a little bit early so you could get you know, a very well-made dish instead of a during-the-service rush dish, it's very hard to be completely and entirely brutally honest if something's not good. But as a public figure and as someone that people follow and look up to and, and sort of are impressionable by, 
you want to be honest. And I've tried really hard over the years to be honest. So if I haven't got something nice to say, I try not to say it. Or the old feedback sandwich, like if you've got to say something that is honest and true, but not, you know, amazing for the venue, fit it in there in a way that's not... Constructive? Well, it's not... I mean, the thing with any social media, it is constructive, but it, the thing with social media is it's it snowballs. Good or bad, it snowballs. And so if you punch someone and you just leave it with a punch, it snowballs into someone else kicking them and then they're down and they're just getting the boot laid into them very quickly. Whereas if you can kind of say, look, this wasn't great, but I liked X, Y, Z, then it's very difficult for people to just jump on the bandwagon and keep slamming them without looking like they're going for blood unnecessarily. Or do they come for you? They go, hang on, I was at that venue last week and had the best burger of my life. How could you, you know? Yeah, look, uh, it's it's happened to me um, at friends' venues. It's happened to me regularly. Uh, not regularly, but like randomly, I should say. The unfortunate thing with is like hospitality is based still, hopefully, on human element, right? Mm-hmm. Like the service is from humans. Humans cook the food. And so humans aren't perfect. So we make mistakes. And, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there are processes that mistakes could be picked up on, um, you know, rectified, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, like, we are all human. We all make mistakes. So sometimes you will get a crap meal. Sometimes you will get a burger that doesn't look as good as the one in the photos, doesn't look as good as the one that I got. Sometimes sometimes it's incredibly unfortunate. I, I go to a venue and try to be anonymous and I haven't co- communicated with them that I'm coming and I don't want anything. I'm, I'm like, I've ordered, I want to pay with my key card. They won't take your money or they'll, they'll take your money, but they know it's you. And they've like sent out the best damn looking burger they've ever made with a few little extras and this and that. And you're like, you've just shot me in the foot because like, I'm trying to be honest and I'm trying to convey like, well, this is on the menu. This is what it looks like on the menu. This is my thoughts on it. And you've gone the whole nine yards to kind of glam it up and doll it up. And then you just come across ungrateful. You're like, oh, like. And then their expectations are perhaps well, that you yeah. will give them a glowing uh, across your 250,000 yeah, yeah, like, <laughs> so followers. And I'm, there's, I would argue there's probably influences that don't care a great deal. Like they will say they care, but I don't think they genuinely care about the venues and the hospitality industry. They probably come from a different industry with a different background. And this is fun. Blogging is fun, being an influencer is fun, and getting stuff is fun. But they're more worried about themselves first, their identity, their image, their reputation, the venue second. Mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong, like, I like myself and I like my image and my brand and my reputation. (laughs) But I often tend to side with venues over the influencers, not the influencers, but the general public in terms of. You know, like I'm not going to go somewhere and, and and if someone approaches me and says, hey, we want to pay you $300 to come review our venue and I look at the venue and I've never been to the venue and I go, this doesn't look great. Like the food doesn't look mm. good. I, If I've been to the venue, I go, maybe it's like just not a great venue. I've seen how they operate. I go, maybe it's I don't trust the venue. Well, you've built a brand and you, you know, compromising that brand yeah. comes at a cost as well, doesn't it? So maintaining your integrity and your authenticity. It's huge. It is huge. Yeah. And, and how can you measure the social media penetration you're having, like to your clients and their brands? I mean, can you prove increased brand recognition and sales? Look, it's from day one. The minute I, I started Chukru Media, like you, you – offer services to a, a restaurant or a business mm-hmm. and they want, like if they're spending, if they're putting out money, they want ROI statistics. What am I getting back? Yep. And in the in the beginning and, and with Instagram, it, it was so hard because it was a sort of slow burn. And even now with TikTok, to an extent, yeah, okay, followers might jump up, sales might jump up, but, you know, you might get followers out of a post, but those followers may not come in store and spend money, which – in hospo, really, that is what you're judged on. You live and die by, like, money in the till. 100%. So you might get 100 followers on social media, but if they're not coming in and spending money in the next week or two, the business isn't happy. Mm. But, like, I live in far western Sydney. I might see something in Coogee and go, man, I love the look of that. I want to go to it. But I might not go to Coogee for another six months. Mm-hmm. So what I saw six months ago worked. Like, it got me hooked. 
but it's just six months until the ROI is complete and I've actually invested money in, into the business. You know, it's not dissimilar to a marketing company that's doing old traditional marketing. Yeah, you know, 100%. You know, whether you're dropping flyers or you're placing ads, you know, that so often it's a, it's a slow burn. Yeah. The only difference is that traditional marketing, I think, was more localized. Mm. So maybe it was a little bit faster, like the return. You know, if you drop a letterbox and someone comes in store holding that flyer because they live two blocks away, mm -hmm. it's different to – if your business was in Kuji and you went and did a letterbox drop in Parramatta, mm -hmm. like, again, it might work, but it might take four months, five months, six months till the next summer season to actually see the return on, on your investment six months earlier. Exactly. Well, who, who are your customers? Uh, prim primarily fast food, like small. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like sort of family owned operated businesses and it's partly, I'm, I'm not, Naive, like I have, I, I'm not trained. I haven't got a uni degree, so my skill set is to a certain limit and extent. So once you start, you know, if if you're a, a hospo group or if you're a, a franchise or a, a chain of venues, like my skill set doesn't extend that far. It's very difficult once you start going. All right, we need press releases. We need X, Y, Z. We need you communicating with all these other like. I'm uncomfortable with that. I don't even have a computer at home that I use. Like everything is done on my smartphones. Mm. So once venues start getting to that that place and that size, I start going like, or if or if a venue of that size approaches me, I'm kind of hands off. I'm like, look, I I don't think I have the skill set for you. Single stores, a couple of stores, family owned, operated. Like my my budget, my price point, what I cost works with their model long term, and I don't want um. A churn and burn type philosophy where traditional marketing, I think, and, and PR agencies, and, and I work with them and I love them all, but like I feel like they look at them as campaigns and not as clients. Mm -hmm. Like it's a three month campaign. Once it's ended, move on. And we make what we can get out of that three months. Whereas, you know, I've got some social media clients I've been with for five and a half years because when I start working with someone, unless they're a pop up or a business that have an end goal already, like I go, I don't want to work with you for three months and kind of do a reno and move on. Like it's a relationship and that's where it comes back to the consultation. Like if I'm working with you long-term, you don't need to pay me a consultation fee. Like each time I come in, we just bounce and I'll give you feedback and it'll be honest because it's direct, but I've got the experience and the knowledge behind me of the industry to kind of give you a broader opinion than just me as a consumer and a diner. Yeah. What I've noticed recently is you've been going into venues and changing up the menu. Yeah. So kind of creating your own a burger or a sandwich or what have you. Yeah. Um, why are you doing that? And have you seen there's been an uptake? Like, is that is that getting traction for you? Yeah. I'm loving it, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, look, in part, I think there are some venues that if I've worked with for a long time, I've exhausted the whole menu. I've eaten everything. And that that's... Like, as a consumer, social media platforms are consumers themselves. So if you've shown everything to the platform, it becomes stale. So you want to try – like, when we go out and eat, we want to try something new. The social media platform and it's – your followers want to consume something new. So if the venue itself kind of aren't in a position or it's very difficult – and it, it seems easy, but it's a very tedious process to change a menu for a venue. So sometimes it's easier if I just go – Look, I know what stock you're holding. You're like, you look at a menu, you know what stock is there. And then you go, there's no reason necessarily, unless there's a massive change in the process required, that you can't kind of put what would normally be in an ABC sandwich, but you've got like D on the side. Why can't you make it an ABCD sandwich? And sometimes it works and you share it with the internet and the followers love it. There's, there's a venue in Neutral Bay. When they opened four years ago, they had one burger on the menu. They didn't even want the burger on the menu. It was like a last minute, like, oh, he's Californian. He's like, I'll put it on there. Mm. And I think now he's got, oh, he's still only got one burger on the menu, but there's like four off menu burgers that are permanently available. We've added the fried chicken because I pushed him to do it. And the fried chicken has three or four options. Is that clear or do you need like a secret handshake or something Look, to well, and, have access to it? Um, it's always good. It, 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 that's where the sort of the ROI on the social media investment comes from. Because if you've shared something on social media that's not on signage in store and it's not on the menu that's printed on the website 
and a customer comes in and holds a phone up to your face at the, the register and goes, what's this? I want to order this. The person on the register always hates me because they're like, oh, my God, that's not in the pause. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? But it shows straight away. I'm like, yeah, but they ordered it, didn't they? Didn't they? So it, it straight away shows like a conversion on all that hard work that we're doing online. They're doing it in store. So how do you how do you keep your posts fresh? I mean, a burger isn't a burger, right? But the, you, you know, repetition. So when yeah, you're yeah. looking at you know grilling the patties and adding the cheese, and with your posts and content, how do you keep it fresh and and different? Look, I I sat down with one of my clients the other week, and I said to them, I was like, and it was one of the venues that have had the same menu for a couple of years now, and and it's kind of like we've shot everything multiple times, and I just said to, and and he looked at me, he's like, oh, what do we really need to get photos of? And I was like. Every single time I come, you should be trying to make food better than the previous time. And if the food looks better than the previous time, then the new photos will be better to post. So sometimes you could post the same burger multiple times. But if it looks better every time, I mean, it might just might have been perfect the first time. As long as it's perfect every time, then someone, some consumer will want it because there's constantly new consumers mm-hmm. that you're trying to reach as well as the old ones that you're trying to satisfy. But it's also, you know, moving with trends. This year more than ever, and, and you've got a, a long hospo background, so you would appreciate this as well, like cost of goods have gone through the roof. Mm-hmm. And so more than ever, you've got to be very selective in kind of what goods you're using, looking at your wastage and kind of your ordering and, you know, do we really need it or how much are we going through? And, and so maybe it's a trend like that that you all of a sudden – like this year when we couldn't get iceberg lettuce and everyone pivoted and started using coleslaw cabbage. or cabbage yeah. or, or just negating it altogether – and so instead of having a whole menu of salad sandwiches, maybe you start going, oh, the, the Reuben, mm-hmm. like with sauerkraut, always available, pickles, always available, mm-hmm. and going down that route. So sometimes the, the industry kind of forces your hand, and sometimes overseas trends can generate interest. Like Australia, as great as we are as a country, are always a little bit behind, I think, other big Western countries, Europe and the Americas and, and even Asian trends now, like Japan and Hong Kong and Singapore, like are such big economies now that um, they really, I think, start a lot of trends and they flow into our, our hospo here. Well, what's your favorite burger? Do you have a, you don't have to say the venue because I know that could, yeah, <laughs> probably not a good idea. Um, like, honestly, I eat so many and there are so many good ones that I, I, I genuinely couldn't. Um, but what do one. you like on your burger? Do you like beetroot, egg? No, no, like, like mustard, like, pickles. So I'm like my preference in a burger is a smash burger, like a smash patty. So yeah. the, the ones that some people gawk at and go, oh, it's thin and crispy and overcooked and dry. Like I love that. Okay. Um, when it's done well, I should say, because it can be done badly as well. And then it's neither here nor there. It's just kind of like a weird in between thing. And there's quite a few venues that do an amazing smash burger in Sydney. And of the ones that do amazing smash burgers, they're either getting – really good quality fresh mince, or a lot of them are, are trying to mince it themselves. And so I think without saying a venue, like that that model, that process of like, all right, we're going to buy whole cuts so we have full control over the blend, mince our own meat, and then it's as fresh as possible because we only need to mince the amount we need. Unlike when you're ordering where sometimes you've got to order a little more than you need or you know, you've know you over-ordered and you're sitting on stock and and then smashing it, done, simple. And, and I just like a normal cheeseburger, like pickles, raw onion, Good burger sauce, smash patty. What about Providence? Does that come into play when you go into a burger joint? Do you go, okay, these guys, are, you know, um, where are they getting their beef from? Are they sourcing their vegetables locally? Does that come into account? Uh, look, this is probably where I let the hospitality industry down. Like, I, even though I grew up in a farming area, like, I don't find that as important mm-hmm. um, to me as a consumer. Even I've, I've got some friends who are um, – and I think you're friends with Jamie Gannon as well. He was he was flogging off the virtue to me of a venue of his where everything on the menu is sourced within 50 kilometers and how proud he was. And and I can appreciate that. But to me as a consumer, I go, I don't care. Hmm. I'm like, yeah, but is that steak that you got from within 50 kilometers a better steak than the one you could have gotten from the Darling Downs or from Tamworth? Or Because if it's not a better steak, then it doesn't necessarily, you know, excite me. Mm-hmm. Um. I, I'm all for supporting local business where we can, but it's also got to be sustainable to your, you know, if the local guy isn't cheaper than the market, it's very hard in your business model to look at that and go, well, oh, I'm going to keep buying local when 
then you've got to put the cost up, which then alienates your local customers. So you're supporting the local suppliers, but you're alienating the local customers. Yeah, and it's, it's just, a complete metrics. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. a very horrible balance to try and please everyone. But in, in theory, like I do like to know where it's coming from, mm-hmm. where I can. Mm-hmm. I'm just not that fussed on it being from local um, unless I think, you know, it's silly if, if you're in a – premium region for a specific thing and then you neglect to hero that aspect. Yep. Mm. So can I ask you this? Who inspires you, either from a business perspective or a personal perspective or somebody that's perhaps paved the way before you in the social sphere? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Look, uh, and uh, again, I don't want to sound arrogant. Like in terms of social media and being a foodie, I don't know if there were really – like, don't get me wrong. There were your food reviewers and, and like, Anthony Bourdain and all this. I've honestly not watched much of his stuff. Um, I grew up watching Adam Richman, the man vs. food guy, and I wouldn't <laughs> say he's a food reviewer, but he is more of what I think of myself as in terms of an entertainer. Mm-hmm. Like, he promoted venues. He promoted dishes at venues. But he did it in a way that really wasn't critical and it was fun. And it was very entertaining. Yeah, and you yeah. can you can see that – Postman versus food, he was like the show was as much about him as it was the food and the venue, like his identity, his struggle ship through eating these challenges and whatnot. And that's what I hope for. Like it, it's naive to think that the role I have now and sort of social media in general, whether it's Instagram or TikTok, will last forever. Mm. And so you've got to build something that is sustainable post this era. That was actually a question I wanted to ask you, your, well, not prediction, but where social media influencers are heading, you know? What's your, what's your opinion on that? Uh, look, I think I, – I don't think they're going anywhere by any means. Like, there will always be influencers and there will always be um, dollar spend on advertising through influencers because they're creating impressions and they're influencing people. In the last 12 months, um, I've noticed a definite change in – I wouldn't say the persona, that's the wrong word, and the demands certainly isn't the right word. But because TikTok can really shotgun someone from nothing to someone quite quickly, one or two TikToks can go viral. You can get 20,000, 30,000 followers from those one or two TikToks. Boom, you're a somebody. It's almost this like – Cash grab. And I, I don't want to offend people, but, you know, I reckon I was on Instagram and had a following and a significant following for three or four years before I even started to think about approaching a venue for money. Mm. And it's easy for someone to say, like, oh, I'm very busy. Like, I have a full-time job on the side. Like, as you said, I was working as a chef. I had family and kids. I still wasn't thinking about charging money because I go, as long as I get the free food, it's cost me nothing. It's win-win. As an influencer, you need content. Like, without Mm. content, you're useless. Mm -hmm. You're influencing no one. And your followers aren't interested in you unless you're putting out content. So it's a symbiotic relationship. Like, you need content. The venue wants promotion. For the better part, it's win-win. Now, I can appreciate if a venue approaches me and offers me money, I will take it. Like, I need to put food on my table for my kids. I need to pay for dentistry. I need to pay for all sorts of things. So I'm not saying that, like, as an influencer, you shouldn't have a value on yourself. And in cer- certain circumstances, you shouldn't try and monetize and, and make it more viable for you to double down. And, you know, if you're making some money here, you can reinvest in money here, whether it's equipment or more food or fancier meals. But it's it's still one of those things where, like, I approached someone the other day and they were just flat out like, we're not doing anything unless it's paid. Hmm. And each to their own. But I just wrote back and said, like, my business, True Crew Media, like, we don't work with people with that attitude. Hmm. Because I pay some influencers to come to my venues and, and promote them. But they've usually done a couple of freebies in the past or they've done contra visits where they were happy with food or they've scratched my back and this is me scratching their back in return. And that just boils back down to relationships. Yeah. You know, the human element to it. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's not just transactional. But I I think it also comes back to where I was saying some influencers genuinely care about the venue. Yeah. Like if you genuinely care about a venue and the hospo, you will do it pro bono, contra. 
and not completely because you're still getting something in return. You're getting a free meal. You're getting the content that you need for your followers. But you're finding a middle ground that everyone wins. Mm -hmm. The minute you take payment from a venue, you win. Mm. You get money and you get your content. The venue just gets promotion. So I see it as two versus one. Like the scale is tipped in your favor. So where would you like to be in five years? I mean, pre-COVID, I was starting to look at opening my own venue. Mm-hmm. Um, because a I burger joint? Well, I want burgers to be involved with it. I, I don't want to pigeonhole myself specifically to burgers because I think if I'm known as the burger guy and all I do is burgers, yep. like the expectation is almost too high to meet. Like there will just be this perception that everything will be amazing and I have to be perfect and I'm putting myself up on a stage to get crucified. Almost. Because everyone's going to want to come and judge my burger after I've spent six years <laughs> judging <laughs> others. And I'm That's aware it. of it. Like, I yeah. expect it. So I think it's important that I'm aware of that and, and diversify and go, you know, I might love burgers and I might know a lot about burgers, but burgers might not be the right business model for me to get into. So I need to have a business that is sustainable without burgers, but I can incorporate burgers into and so I was looking at leasing. I put offers in on spots and then COVID hit and I went, oh, wow, thank, thank goodness I didn't. You know, we were homeschooling the kids. Um, the, the Campbell, like the, the LGA lockdowns and stuff made it really messy being in an in a outer Western Sydney suburb. And I don't want to get involved in the politics, but it was messy in Western Sydney, mm. like with those LGA lockdowns. Like it was very strict. It was enforced quite hard. Um, and I went, thank goodness I we didn't get that spot. And then the next summer rolled around and we went, COVID's passed. You know, everything we read was kind of like we're through it. Started looking again. Put another couple of offers in on places and didn't get them. Like they wouldn't come down in price or the, they sold to someone else. Or And we went into that second year of COVID during the winter and, and harsher lockdowns and even more issues. And I went, oh, my gosh, the universe is literally telling me <laughs> not to do this. How lucky am I? Like how fortunate and then we came out of COVID again, sort of last Christmas. And I was like, oh, I'm going to wait a little longer this time and just watch how the industry – because it's one thing when you get knocked down and you get back up. It's harder when you get knocked down the second time to get back up. So I was wondering how the hospital industry would be and just watching it from my my perspective and, and seeing it, not even just on a hyper-local sense, but, you know, Melbourne, Brisbane, interstate, like hospitality was – bleeding. Venues were busy. Don't get me wrong. Like everyone loved being able to go out again and pubs were full and clubs were busy. And, but when you see behind the scenes, like there were cracks galore, like staffing was a nightmare and the supply chain had broken down, like floods in Queensland and storms in Melbourne and this and that. And it was hard enough for existing businesses with loyal customer base to sustain a business. Mm -hmm. When you're a new business, you have a window. You have like a, a three-month period. It's like a, a dating relationship. Honeymoon. Like, yeah, like yeah. You, you have this period to make a good impression. Yeah. And if you don't make a good impression, you're gone. People move on. And you might have a five-year lease, but if you get a reputation in the first three months to be unreliable, inconsistent, um, substandard, you're gone. Like, So now it's January. It's 2023. Yeah. It's a new year, right? Yeah. We're forging ahead. What does the future look like taking all of those learnings that you've yeah, just yeah. said? What, what actually do you think like puts fire in your belly going forward? Do you want to grow the social media marketing company? Do you want to grow your personal brand? Is it a TV show? Oh. Is it that trifecta you were talking about, venue? And, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I, in, in that sense, I'm probably a little bit greedy. Like, I would love it all. I would love to be able to continue working with venues yep. and have my own venue and push sort of my personal stigma or, or my character further, whether that's um, a TV show or YouTube series or, or – um, but it's just near impossible, like, to sort of balance it all. And, and yeah. keeping in mind, like, I love my family and I've got young children – um, and I'm very appreciative of the fact that, like, there's only, like, you know, you can't look at them when they're 18 and go, oh, I wish I could go back to when you were, like, cute and eight. Like, you got to make the most of those years while you can. Mm-hmm. And that's what I 
our son now starts year one in three weeks. And I kind of always had said, like, I didn't want to go back into chefing or get a buy my own venue or set up my own venue until he was at school. Because I wanted to make the most of those years where he was kind of reliant on me and, and, you know, make the most of that period. And so by all means, like if, if I look at the hospital industry and I think that it's viable for a new business and I, and I want to do it in Western Sydney. So it's got to be like a business that I'm happy with the food that I'm putting out, but that's at a price point and an availability that Western Sydney want and, and sort of desire, then I'll do it. Um, like we've, we, when we started looking at leasing two years ago, like we drew up the business model, we, we had branding done, we had already pretty much locked in what we would do. It was just finding the right spot. And that's all still sitting there. And I think in the current climate, that model would still work. Um, well, if any of our listeners want to reach out to you in our show notes, we'll have all your handles and your yeah, email please. and all of that. But also they can just hop on and, and direct message you perhaps yeah, on I'm, your Instagram. People get shocked yeah. when I write back to their messages. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know if they think I'm some you, like upper echelon being like I'm a, <laughs> a bloke from Western Sydney. And I'm like, we're all busy. Like, yeah. So if you've got time to message me, unless it's a silly question that doesn't need a response, like then I've got time to give you a response. So everyone, yeah, message me if you've got advice. Well, I've got to say, Isaac, it has been such a pleasure chatting with you. And, uh, you know, hearing your story, your personal story, and you being so candid and and um, open to share it is is just fabulous. And I can't thank you enough for coming in today. And, um, yeah, we will, um, like I said, put put all your details in the show notes. Is there anything in closing you'd like to to say to our listeners? Uh, just make sure you're following me and no, nah, but honestly, yeah. like I think everyone is like, I'm anxious about starting something new in terms of the business. If, if whatever it is, if it's working out at the gym or learning a new skill or like, if you're anxious about doing it this year, like, as you said, 2023, January, new start, just do it. Like, oh. or have a crack at it at least. That's it. That's it. Alrighty. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for tuning in with us today. We really hope you enjoyed listening as much as we've enjoyed the conversation. You'll find links to anything mentioned in today's chat in the show notes. We have some more extraordinary guests lined up and we would love you to join us again. So please make sure you're following us on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss future episodes. We'd also love to hear any of your feedback, good or bad, or perhaps you've got a guest you'd love to hear from. You can let us know. And the best way to stay up to date with what we're doing, who we're talking to, and where you'll find us around the country is to become part of the Straight to the Source community at straighttothesource.com.au forward slash community. Until next time.